let's talk a little bit about this course. All right, we've got four nights to discuss the Book of Acts. Now, the Book of Acts isn't the kind of book in the Bible that most of us tend to read for our devotions. You know, most Christians look at the book of Acts and they think of it, well, it's pretty much a history book. It is a history book in many ways, but the book of Acts treats a lot of extremely profound topics. And I'm going to go through a list of some of those topics with you later. Now, the way we're going to approach this book is tonight I'm going to give you an overview, and we probably will not even get out of chapter one tonight. The course is going to be laid out chapter 1 tonight, chapters 2 and 3 next week, chapters 4 through 12 the following week, and the rest of the book in the fourth week. Now, my purpose is not to lead you verse through verse through this, by, verse by verse through this book. What I want to do is deal with the important events and the important issues in the book. And there are a lot of important events and important issues in the book. And many of these issues bear directly on us in Hong Kong in the year 2016. One of those issues, I'll just throw this out there for you to think about right now, is the question of whether it is acceptable in God's eyes for Christians to intentionally eat blood. Now, believe it or not, the book of Acts addresses that issue and answers that in a very clear way. All right? It's just one of many issues. Speaking in tongues. What is speaking in tongues? Why did it happen? Should we be doing it? That's addressed in the book of Acts. You will see that the book of Acts gives us an indirect answer to what Jesus was talking about when he said to Peter, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Remember that very strange statement? Well, we're going to find an answer to that in the book of Acts. There are lots of really, really interesting and important things in the book of Acts. Okay? Well, what I want to start with is by giving you an overdue, overview of what we would call introductory matters for the book of Acts. Okay? Now, you may want to take some notes on these. Um, oh, actually, you don't need to. I'm sorry. On the first page of your handout, you'll find most of the information listed that I'm about to share with you. Okay? All right, let's talk about the author. The author of the book of Acts is Dr. Luke. Now, in Colossians chapter 4, 14, Paul calls Luke the beloved physician. Luke was a medical doctor. I want you to look, if you have a Bible, and by the way, if you didn't bring a Bible tonight, next week bring a Bible. If it's on your phone, if it's on your tablet, if it's printed, whatever, that's fine, but you really need to bring a Bible. I want you to look at the very first chapter of the book of Acts, and listen as I read the first three verses to you. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of th the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now do you see that first line? The former account I made, O Theophilus. See that name? I don't know why none of us name our kids Theophilus. It's a really nice name. In Greek, it means friend of God or lover of God. Now, turn in your Bible to the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. First chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And let's see what Luke says there in the first paragraph. He says, In as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us, 
just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now you can see that Luke wrote both of these books for this person named Theophilus. And did you know that the Gospel of Luke plus the book of Acts makes up 30% of the New Testament? It's huge. It's absolutely huge. Now Luke, being a medical doctor, was a person who was interested in science, and he was interested in facts. And as you read his introduction to Luke, and you read his introduction to Acts, what do you see? You see that one of Luke's purposes is to lay down an orderly account of events which were already known to some of the people to whom he was writing. <coughs> Luke is thinking about the future, and he's saying it's important for those who live in the future to know reliably these facts. So both of these books are, in a very uh, clear way, historical. And yet, I think you all know that anytime anybody writes a history book, that person writes a history book for a purpose and focuses on certain things and leaves other things out. When I was growing up in America, and we studied world history, guess which country got the most attention? America. Right? American history books are full of America, even if they're world history books. Because every historian has a focus of interest. We will see in this story that the focus of interest is first going to fall on the Apostle Peter, and later it's going to transfer to the Apostle Paul. Okay? Now, what about the date of this book? When was this book written? Well, we'll see a little bit later that there's reason to believe that this book was completed shortly before Paul was released from his first Roman imprisonment. I'll give you the chronology of the events of Acts a little bit later, and you'll see why that is. But Paul is still in prison when this book is completed. And a lot of people have said, why didn't Luke wait until Paul was out of prison to complete the book? That's an interesting question, and I'll suggest some reasons for that later. Now, the historical setting of this book moves all over the place, doesn't it? We've got events happening in Jerusalem, we've got events happening in Syria, in Cyprus, in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Rome, Malta. Um, there's lots of movement in this book. And it covers the time from the ascension of Christ, when he returns to heaven after his resurrection, up until around A.D. 62. We pick the date A.D. 62 because it was probably around A.D. 63. We don't know exactly when Nero began to publicly persecute Christians and began to, you know, throw them into the lion's den and tie them to poles and pour tar on them and set them on fire and do many horrible things that he did. Okay, and that's not mentioned in the book and Paul is still imprisoned in the book, so it probably was finished around A.D. 62. Now, theologians like to use this word provenance. Provenance simply means where the author was when he wrote the book. We don't really have any idea. A good guess is that he was with Paul in Rome when he finished, because the last thing he writes about is Paul being under house arrest in Rome. Now, his audience is formerly, formally this guy, Theophilus. But obviously, Luke had in mind a much broader audience. We are part of the people for whom he wrote this book. Now, when scholars and non-scholars study this book, there are a number of things that they tend to argue about. There are a number of disputed issues about this book. There are a few people who don't think that Luke wrote it. 
Now, one of the reasons people question whether Luke, uh, whether Luke wrote all of the book is that there are places in the book where the author says, we went here, we went there, we went there, and then he switches and says, they went, they went, they went. And so some people think that this book might have been put together from the accounts of two different people. But I think it's pretty clear that Luke wrote it. The second thing up here, you see reliability of sources? Well, until the late 1800s, when people read the book of Acts, they would see Luke mentioning certain Roman officials. He would talk about Politarchs and Plutarchs and Ethnarchs. These are all Greek terms. And people said, this book must be fictional because nobody's ever heard of Politarchs or Ethnarchs or Plutarchs. And so a lot of people said, this book is not historically reliable. Then some archaeologists were digging in Corinth and they dug up a pavement stone and there chipped into the pavement stone is the name of Erastus, a guy who's named in this book and it says Erastus, um, I think it's Politarch of Corinth. And since that time, archaeology has unearthed more and more evidence to indicate that this book is historically accurate. In fact, the experts have been forced to swallow their words where they said it wasn't accurate. So we live in a great time in history, not just for the book of Acts, but for all of the Bible. There is more and more evidence coming in from archaeology that validates the accuracy of the things that the Bible records in history. Now, as you read through this book, I'm sure you're aware that the latter part of the book traces a lot of Paul's movements. Paul makes three missionary journeys, and then he gets arrested, and he gets sent to Rome. Well, people have tried to connect the accounts of Paul's movements in this book with the accounts of Paul's movements that you see in his letters, and that can be difficult to do. But it turns out it can be done, and it does make sense, and most people no longer argue about that. Now, the last one that I want to mention has to do with variations in Greek texts, and this is a fairly technical thing, but it's not something that you will have any difficulty understanding. You all know that the New Testament was originally written in Greek, right? In fact, the 27 books of the New Testament were all individual books at one time, written by people like Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, James or Jacob, depending on how you name him. Those were all in Greek, and we, as far as we know, don't have a single one of the originals that any of those men wrote. What we have today are copies that were made by early Christians where they would put down the original letter, and then they'd get writing materials, and they would copy it by hand, because there was no printing in those days, no photocopying, none, none of the wonderful things that we have today. There are hundreds of Greek manuscripts of the book of Acts from the early centuries of the church, and they don't all agree in all of the tiny details. Now, the major story is clear, there are no major discrepancies but scholars always like to argue, why is this one slightly different than that one? Why are these sentences reversed? And you know what? I don't think we're going to know the answer to those questions until Jesus comes back. And quite frankly, I'm not worried about it. If you do read those in Greek, you get the same story, whether you're reading this manuscript or that, that manuscript. So none of these things are anything that should cause you to doubt the reliability of this book. Now Luke has a lot of special features. Okay? I want you to take a look at the very first verse of the book again. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. That's very interesting. Luke says, in my gospel, I talked about what Jesus began to do. 
And that sounds a little strange, doesn't it? Because by the time we get to verse 11, in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus leaves. And, and you tend to think, well, wait a minute, I guess his job is over. He's left the earth. He's not doing anything anymore. But the way that Luke writes that, you get the impression that Luke is saying that in this second volume of his two-volume set, he's talking about the things that Jesus continues to do. Because you see Jesus showing up again in the book, don't you? You see him appearing to Stephen in heaven as Stephen is getting stoned. You see him coming to Paul on the road to Damascus and taking Paul, who I feel a lot of kinship with because I was a lot like Paul before I became a Christian. I was a person who attacked Christians. That was my hobby, attacking Christians. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ took Paul and he said, I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. And for the rest of his life, Paul had to become the enemy of the people who were his friends and the friend of the people who were his enemies. Right? Before he got saved, the Jews who rejected Jesus were his friends. After he got saved, what did they spend their time trying to do? Kill him. Right? So Jesus does continue to appear in this book. There are some interesting statements where you'll see and the Lord added to the church daily. After the apostles and the Christians are out there doing the hard work of evangelism, they're the ones talking to their neighbors, telling them the gospel, and people get saved. The book of Acts does not say, good job, Christians. The book of Acts says, that's Jesus at work. Now, they were doing a good job. And what they were doing was worthy of God's praise. But it's the Lord Jesus who is working to build the church as the events of the book of Acts occur. So he's there all the time. Okay? So, this book will emphasize the work of the Holy Spirit, but it will also emphasize the ongoing work of Jesus. It gives the historical framework for the New Testament epistles. Epistles, by the way, is just a fancy word for letters. You all know that. Um, this is really interesting. This book gives a chronicle both of the early church's successes and failures. Not everything that they do in this book is a success. But they keep moving forward. All right? Now, do we have any lawyers in the audience? Is anybody here a lawyer? No? Okay. Well, <clears throat> that's too bad. The book of Acts is a very interesting legal document. In, some, in fact, some people think that the book of Acts was prepared as a legal brief to be presented to the Romans when Paul came up for trial to show that everything that he had done within the empire of Rome was protected under Rome's law, which said that Jews had a legal right to religious freedom. See, it wasn't until Nero's persecution came that Rome began to treat Christians, and, and by the way, most of the early Christians were Jews, that Rome began to treat Christian Jews differently than non-Christian Jews. Some people think that this book was part of a legal defense for Paul, and that's quite possible. And the, the book definitely deals with legal issues of Christianity. Because you've got Paul getting arrested. And then he'll say, you, you, you have no right to arrest me. I'm a Roman citizen. I didn't do anything wrong. You haven't given me a trial. And he's going to use his legal status within the empire of Rome as a tool in sharing the gospel. Now that might be a hint to us that we too should be worldly wise in the use of government law when possible to protect ourselves when we are sharing the gospel. Very interesting thing to think about. This book also addresses 
Jew-Gentile issues in the early church. Now, how many Jews are here? How many of you are Jewish? Okay, I'm Jewish, right? We got one Jew and 150 non-Jews, right? In the early church, the numbers were much more even, and it's hard for us here in Hong Kong to understand how Gentiles felt about Jews and how Jews felt about Gentiles. Jews tended to look down upon Gentiles. Some Jews would call Gentiles dogs. Some of the Pharisees would get up in the morning and they'd say this prayer every morning. Dear God, I thank you that I was not born a woman or a Gentile. It's true. It's true. And the Gentiles, on their part, didn't look kindly on the Jews because they knew that the Jews looked down on them. So there was a lot of hostility between Jews and Gentiles. And when the church started growing and people got saved, you've got Jews and Gentiles now part of this same group. And they would get together to worship. They'd get together to participate in the Lord's table. And they'd have what we would call a love feast in America or a potluck dinner where everybody gets together and brings some food and they share. Well, the Gentile shows up with some nice pork and tomato soup. And the Jew, he doesn't eat pork. So what do you do? Does the Jew tell the Gentile, you can't eat that anymore because now you are a follower of the God of Israel. Or is it proper for the Gentile to say to the Jew, you can eat this because you're no longer under the Mosaic Law. Now most of us would say that the second one is the right answer. And I agree with that. But when the church first was formed, it wasn't obvious to them what the right answer was. And we're going to see in the book of Acts people dealing with this and coming to an understanding so that the gospel can continue to go out and the church can continue to grow and people can come in without feeling, well, when I go in there, they're going to make me eat things I don't want to eat or they're not going to let me eat what I do want to eat. Eating is important, isn't it? Okay. Now, this sixth one is kind of interesting. <clears throat> The title of this book is Praxis. Praxis means the acts of the apostles. Now, the Greeks and Romans were very fond of their heroes. You know, they had Zeus, they had Atlas, they had these many gods that they worshipped. And they had books about their great deeds. Those books were called the Praxis of those great men. Well. This book is called the Praxis of the Apostles. It means the Great Acts of the Apostles. The church viewed this book not as saying that the Apostles were superhuman or anything like that, but it did view this book as saying that the Apostles were special people. They were specially appointed by Christ with a special mission, and they carried that mission out in the power of the Holy Spirit most of the time. And so this book deals with that. Now, anytime you read a book of the Bible and you're trying to sort of get a handle on it as a whole, it's a good question to ask yourself, what's the purpose of this book? Why did Luke write this book? Why did the Holy Spirit lead Luke to write this book? And that's often a hard question to answer unless the author answers it for you. Now, if you're in the first chapter of Acts, it's very easy for you to turn backwards to the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. Turn to the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. And we're going to see that John does something very nice for us. In verse 30, he tells us why he wrote his Gospel. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, 
and that believing you may have life in his name. Now John's gospel is really nice in that he tells us the purpose of his book. Now Luke gives us a hint of the purpose of his book in those first three verses, but it's not as clear as what John gives us. Now some people view the book of Acts as a history of the early church. It certainly does give us part of the early church's history. Some people view it as a gospel of the Holy Spirit. We've got four gospels of Jesus telling about his life. In some ways, the book of Acts is telling us how the Holy Spirit took the place of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was about to leave? He said, when I leave, I'll send you another helper. There is a way in which the book of Acts is kind of a record of the things that the Holy Spirit did. So that's one view. As we said earlier, some people think it's a legal brief to defend Paul. As we also noted earlier, some people think it's an account of Christ continuing to work after he returned to heaven. Now, 5 and 6 are views that you will run into if you read commentaries. One view is that this is a second century book. That means it was written after A.D. 100. Now Luke was dead before A.D. 100. So anybody who holds this view doesn't believe that Luke wrote this book. Some people have said that it was an attempt to lessen Jewish-Gentile tension in the church. This is based on a theory that Peter, as the apostle to the Jews, and Paul as the apostle to the Gentiles, didn't get along with each other. They were always fighting, and their disciples continued to fight after they were gone. And then somebody came along and wrote this book, and they wrote this book in an attempt to rewrite history to make the early Christians think that Paul and Peter were friends. Now, I don't buy that at all. I don't think it's true. Another view that I don't accept is that this book was written to defend Paul's actions to commend him to the Roman Jews. Now, if you've looked at this book recently, you may be aware that in the very last chapter of the book, where Paul is still under arrest in Rome, a bunch of Jews come to talk to him. And I think at some level they're hoping that he will agree with them and they won't have to view him as an enemy. But Paul doesn't agree with them. He sticks to his story. His story is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah who died on the cross and rose from the grave in order to bring eternal life to all people, Jew and Gentile. Now, when Paul tells that to the Jews in Rome, they say, we don't want anything to do with this message. And Paul says, fine, if you Jews won't listen, I'm going to continue to preach to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what Paul did. After Paul got out of prison, he continued his missionary work. Many people believe that he got as far, um, as far west as Spain. He was later arrested and he was executed. But Paul refused to say that the gospel is only for the Jews. Paul was convinced that it was for all. Now, I don't think that either, whoops, I went too fast. I don't think that either of those are good candidates for the purpose of the book. But if you read commentaries, you'll sometimes run into them. Okay, now, let me get a drink here. If you jump to page four in your booklet, <clears throat> you will see the chart that I put up on the screen right now. Now, as we will see later tonight, the basic structure of this book is laid out in chapter one in verse eight. What do we see? We're going to see the church being born in chapters 1 and 2. We're going to see the church growing in Judea in chapters 3 through 7. We're going to see the church scattered in chapters 8 through 12. 
And by the way, they don't want to do this. This is one of the interesting things about the book of Acts. Jesus starts out at the beginning of the book by telling them that it's their duty to bring the gospel to the whole world. And what you know what they do? They just stay at home. They don't go anywhere. It's not until Stephen is stoned that they all just run away. And when they run away, they end up sharing the gospel with people. So that's why I've labeled this the scattering of the church. And then starting in chapter 13, we begin to see the intentional outreach of the church. We see the church at Antioch, which is not in Judea. <clears throat> it's a pri primarily Gentile church. We see them saying, you know what? We've got a job. We need to get the good news out into the Roman Empire. And so they pray, and they say, who should we send? And they end up sending Barnabas and Paul. Okay? So this is the basic layout of the church, uh, of the book. The focus is going to be Mount, the Mount of Olives and the Temple. I didn't put Mount of Olives here because I couldn't fit it. And then in this section, the focus is going to be Jerusalem. We're going to move out into Judea and Samaria, and then we go out into the Roman Empire and beyond. Now, we'll look at some of this stuff down here later as we continue to go through the book. Now, here's something <clears throat> that I think is absolutely fascinating, and it was really helpful to me to read this book. Have any of you ever heard of a book called Explore the Book by a guy named J. Sidlow Baxter? It's a fairly old book, and it, if you buy it in one volume, it's about this thick. It's got one to three chapters in it on every book of the Bible, and it traces through them in sequence. And this guy, Baxter, had this amazing ability to sort of see the forest and not get distracted by the trees. He w w would read a book and he would say, these are the key events, this is the flow of thought, these are the important concepts, and he's fantastic at that. Now one of the things that he points out is that there's this really cool parallel between Peter and Paul in the book of Acts. Look at the things that they both do. <clears throat> Peter gives his first sermon in Acts 2, first, uh, Paul gives his first sermon in Acts chapter 8. In chapter 3, Peter heals a lame man. Chapter 14, Paul heals a lame man. In chapter 8, Peter runs into Simon the sorcerer. And in chapter 13, Paul runs into a guy named Elimus, who is also a sorcerer. Um, Peter's shadow, for a time, is going to have the power to heal people. People will line up wanting to be healed by Peter, and Peter doesn't have the time to go and touch everyone, so he just walks by, and if his shadow falls on them, they get healed. Now, by the way, he didn't have that ability for the rest of his life. Okay? It's very interesting to think about the miraculous powers that the Holy Spirit gave to the apostles. Paul does something similar. He can send somebody a handkerchief that he touched, and when they touch the handkerchief, they'll be healed. But you know what? He didn't have that power for his entire life. Because later, when he's in prison, in the imprisonment which will lead to his execution, you can read about that in 2 Timothy, he will write to Timothy and say, I hear you're having stomach problems. Drink a little wine. He doesn't put a handkerchief in the envelope. <laughs> See, it seems that the Holy Spirit limited the time during which the apostles had the power to do miracles. It was there long enough to demonstrate that they really were the agents of God and really were the apostles of Jesus Christ. But they didn't have it forever. Okay? Um, Peter will lay hands on someone, and Paul will lay hands on someone. And the point is, in both cases, they are 
essentially ordaining people to a position in the ministry. Um, Peter is going to be worshipped contrary to his will by Cornelius and his family, and Paul is going to be worshipped contrary to his will by people who will then shortly try to kill him. That's a funny story. One minute they're bowing down to you and they want to give you sacrifices and kiss your feet and they think you're God. And the next minute they're throwing rocks at you. Very strange. Okay? Now, Peter is going to raise Dorcas from the dead and Paul is going to raise Eutychus. Now, I'm really glad that this church doesn't have windows that open. <laughs> Because if it was hot in here, and one of you was sitting on that windowsill, and if you fell out and went down five stories, I could not go down there and raise you from the dead. But Paul did that once. Very interesting. It, by the way, it makes me really happy to know that even Paul could put people to sleep with his preaching. Right? Okay, that, that really, that's very comforting to me. All right? Now, Peter is going to end up in prison, and so is Paul. Now, I don't think that these parallels are accidental. I think that all these things happened, but I think Luke wrote the story to emphasize these similarities between these two men, because remember, Peter is the apostle to the Jews, and Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And the parallel between the things that they do almost says to us, God is just as interested in Gentiles as he is in Jews. Right? And that's a very important message. It's, a, it's an important message today. It was an important message back then. Now, it's interesting. Today, the problem is that Gentile Christians find it very easy to think that Jews are no longer important in God's program. That's where we tend to be today. But back then, the problem was that Jewish Christians tended to think that God didn't care about Gentiles. In fact, this book says that God cares about both. Okay. All right, we've got about 10 minutes before our break. I want to take you through a quick list of some of the important issues and topics that we're going to see as we go through this book. We're going to start in chapter 1 by talking about the issue of Israel and the kingdom. Jesus is going to be teaching the apostles about Israel and the kingdom, and they are going to ask him a very important question. We'll see in chapter 1 that they are going to say, there used to be 12 of us. Now there's only 11. What are we going to do? And they're going to pick Matthias. And the choice of Matthias is a very interesting thing. <clears throat> and people are still debating, did they do the right thing? Because when Paul gets added in, guess how many apostles there are? 13. The number that doesn't appear on any elevators in Hong Kong. <laughs> right? It's kind of interesting. Um, there's lots of talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's very important in this book, and that's directly tied to the topic of speaking in tongues. And we're going to talk a lot about speaking in tongues. Now here's one, you may not have heard this term before. Maybe you have. Remember in the early church, in the early part of the book of Acts, we've got Christians sharing their possessions, their food, everything they've got with each other. Now, some people have looked at those events and said that in the Church of Jesus Christ, there should be no inequalities of wealth. The rich people should give all their money to the church and it should be distributed so everybody's got the same amount. Now, personally, I don't think that's what this book teaches. But you do have to look at this and say, why? Why are they sharing this way? And if that isn't what churches should be doing today, why did they do it then, and why should we not do it now? Okay. We're going to talk about that. All right. 
salvation and baptism. There are two particular places in this book where salvation and baptism are a big issue. One is in chapter 2, Acts 2.38, um, where Peter says, let me, let me read it to you so I get it right. He says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there are some Christian denominations who build their entire theology on that one verse, and their theology says that you're not saved until you are baptized. Now, how many of you believe that if you put your trust in Christ, but you never get baptized, when you die, you will go to hell? How many of you believe that? Good, I'm glad nobody raised your hands. <laughs> right. How many of you believe that if you put your trust in Christ and never get baptized, you will go to heaven? That is the correct answer. But, you have a problem. The problem is, what you just said sounds like it contradicts Acts 2.38. Now, I will help you to see why it doesn't contradict Acts 2.38. The other area where baptism is an issue is in chapter 16, where the Philippian jailer tries to commit suicide when the cell walls fall down, when Paul and Silas are in prison, and they say, don't kill yourself, and he says, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, they, he goes home with Paul and Silas, they share the gospel, and the family gets baptized. But many people put that stuff together, and they say, Paul is saying that if the father believes and gets baptized, the wife and the children will be saved, even if they don't believe. Now that is also bad theology. But we're going to talk about what's going on there when we get to that chapter. Okay? Gentiles and the Mosaic Law. <clears throat> what do you Gentiles have to do? Do you have to give up eating shrimp? Do you have to start wearing clothes with tassels everywhere? Do you have to go to Jerusalem? Do you have to do the kinds of things that Jews had to do under the Mosaic Law? That's a big issue. Miracles and evangelism. There are some Christians in the world today who claim that the only sure way to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ is to do miracles. And so they actually put together these teams of people that go around the world and supposedly do miracles. And they believe that that's going to make people believe. Now one of the things that we're going to see in the book of Acts is that sometimes miracles don't make people believe, and very often people believe without miracles. Okay? You put those two facts together, plus other things that are said elsewhere in Scripture, and you come to the conclusion that miracles in the book of Acts are not for the purpose of making evangelism successful. Miracles are for the purpose of validating the apostles and others who were preaching the gospel as being real messengers from God. But you know what? Even that isn't enough. Even that isn't enough. Just because a person can do miracles that are convincing to you does not guarantee that that person is an agent of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, God through Moses was very careful to warn the Israelites that just because a person could do miracles did not mean that person was a messenger from God. Moses basically said that unless the miracles are convincing, and unless what this person is teaching is consistent with what you already know about God, then you shouldn't trust him. 
<clears throat> now, in the case of the Jews, if a false teacher showed up and did miracles and taught false doctrine, what were they supposed to do with him? Kill him. <laughs> we don't have that responsibility or privilege or right, whatever you want to call it today. We don't have the privilege or the responsibility to kill false teachers. But we do have the responsibility to protect our churches from false teachers. Right? And this, is, this is a responsibility that every one of us in this room needs to take seriously. It really is. False teachers come around surprisingly often. And let me just say to you that if somebody comes to teach in your church, whether he's a visiting preacher or a Sunday school teacher or whatever, and that person <coughs> teaches something which you think is seriously wrong, seriously wrong, you should talk to the leaders of your church about that. You really should. <coughs> you can protect people and stop a lot of damage. Don't be afraid to do that. That's part of your responsibility. The book of Jude says it is our duty to earnestly contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You know what that means? That means to protect the truth and to guard against error. And by the way, we are going to be most capable of doing that when we have a good familiarity with our Bibles. This is one of the reasons why we need to read our Bibles every day. Okay. Now, we've got a few more to go through, and then we'll take our break. Okay. We're going to see a lot of interesting stuff about Paul first persecuting the church, and then converting and becoming the friend of the church. About the second half of the book, a little more than half deals with his missionary work and the current chronology of his career. We will talk about the legal status of Christianity under Rome, and we will talk about the response of Jews to the gospel. Okay. All right, take a look in your little booklet on page 5, and you will see this diagram, not in color. This diagram <clears throat> is to scale. The dates on it are mostly pretty well known. Some of them might be off by a year or something like that. But basically, this lays out the chronology of the Book of Acts. Now, the Book of Acts starts ten days before Pentecost. Christ ascends to heaven forty days after he rose from the dead. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2. All of these events happen very shortly after the cross, obviously. And the book of Acts is going to take us up to around the year 62. Okay? Now let's go through some of the key events in the book of Acts. We've got Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes. A few years later, Stephen is going to be stoned and the church will scatter. A couple of years after that, Paul is going to get saved. And then in the early 40s, Herod is going to kill James, and then God is going to kill Herod. There's that funny story where Herod is eaten by worms. Now, that's a strange story, but he seems to have been given a massive attack of some kind of a parasite that killed him. Now, starting in, if you look down here, M1, see this M1? This is Paul's first missionary journey, which ran from 48 to 49, right? In the latter part of Paul's first missionary journey, he's in Galatia, and Peter comes to visit. Now, for your homework, you might want to read the first two chapters of the book of Galatians. And you will discover that Paul and Peter had a big fight in Galatia. And the fight was over food. 
Because when Peter shows up in Galatia, and he comes to visit the church there, at the beginning he's very comfortable eating a meal with the Gentile Christians and eating their non-kosher food. But later on, somebody shows up from Jerusalem and seems to talk to, to Peter, and Peter pulls back, and he now refuses to eat with the Gentiles. And that's going to cause a lot of bad feelings in the church. And Paul yells at him. Now, Paul and Barnabas are going to go back home, and then they will, to Antioch, then they will go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, a very important event that's recorded in Acts chapter 15 will take place. We call it the Jerusalem Council, where this whole issue comes up. What is proper for Jewish and Gentile Christians to do together. What can we eat? What can we do? What can we not do? That's an extremely important event. They do come to the right decision because the Holy Spirit leads them. And then Paul is going to go on two more missionary journeys. Now it's very significant that this issue is settled here because once this issue is settled, now when Paul and Barnabas and others go out to share the gospel, they don't have to be clueless regarding what to tell the new converts. So that opens the way for more effective evangelism. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, he's going to go back to Jerusalem. Some Jews who hate him will falsely accuse him of desecrating the temple in Jerusalem. He will be arrested for his protection and then he's going to eventually end up in Rome. And that's where the book of Acts ends. Now, just so you know, there's a gap here. Okay? Paul is going to be free, and during this time of this gap, he will write 2 Timothy, he will write the book of Titus, he will probably go to Spain, and then he's going to get arrested somewhere within the Roman Empire, and he's going to end up in his second... Roman imprisonment. He writes about this in 2 Timothy, and he'll never get out of there alive. He will be executed. Okay? That takes us up to approximately AD 67. In AD 70, after a three or four year war between the Romans and the Jews in Israel, Jerusalem will be destroyed. And if we were to continue this on, we would see that over here, in the 80s, probably, John will write his gospel, and in the 90s, John will write the book of Revelation. And that basically takes us to the end of the New Testament period. Okay? Now, there are four other things that appear on here, T1, T2, T3, and T4. These are the four events within the book of Acts where people speak in tongues. It only happens four times. And when we get to those points, we'll start discussing the whole issue, and we will see that speaking in tongues has a very special purpose in the book of Acts. I'll also give you some comments about what's going on in 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about speaking about tongues there. Okay, But that's something we won't go into right now. Now, in a few moments, we're going to dig into the text of Acts chapter 1, but let's look at just a little bit more overview of the book. The first part of the book, the first 12 chapters, Jerusalem is the center, Peter is the chief person, movement is outward only as far as Samaria, the Jews in the homeland, most of them are going to reject the gospel. Some will believe, but most will reject Peter will end up in prison, and Herod will end up being killed by God. In the second part of the book, Antioch, which is in northern Syria, is going to be the center of the book. That's the church that will send Paul and Barnabas out. Paul is going to be the most important person. There's going to be a wide, uh, much wider spreading of the gospel. It's primarily going west into the Roman Empire. The Jews that we would call the Diaspora Jews. Diaspora Jews are Jews that don't live in Israel. Okay? 
Diaspora literally means the scattering of seed. There, you know, Jews are like Chinese. You know that? Everywhere you go in the world, you find Chinese. Isn't that true? And everywhere you go, you find Jews. Right? They're everywhere. You can't get away from them. You can't even get away from Jews here in this class. Um, Paul's going to end up in prison. And then the book is going to close not with the same kind of judgment that Herod received, but the book closes on a very negative note toward Jews, doesn't it? The last thing in the book is Paul saying, you stiff-necked Jews, you won't listen, so I'm going to the Gentiles. And that's how the book ends. Okay? Now, there, if we were to say, what are the three most crucial events in the book... Um, that kind of change the way things are going. There's the stoning of Stephen. There's the accusation of Paul that ends him up in prison. And there's Paul's rebuke to the Jews. Okay? I think, yeah, that's on page four of your notes. Now, the next visual I don't think is in your notes. So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> We're going to cover this again and again and again. But I do want you to get this concept that the book of Acts is showing us the church spreading out from Jerusalem. We're looking at the growth of the church in Acts. And you can see this is Judea, this is Samaria, this is the Mediterranean. Down here we've got the Dead Sea. Uh, Jerusalem is here. Okay. The gospel is obviously first going to take root in Jerusalem. It will be in the temple that the Holy Spirit will come upon the 12 apostles in chapter 2. Next, the gospel is going to take root in Samaria. Philip is going to bring the gospel to Samaria. Now, it's very interesting. People in Samaria will believe the gospel when Philip preaches it. But it's not going to be until Peter shows up and interviews them that they actually speak in tongues. That little detail is very significant, and we'll see why when we get to chapter 8. The third place that the gospel is going to take root is in Joppa. And that's going to be Cornelius and his family. It's very interesting that Joppa is also the place from which Jonah left when he was running away from his duty of going to Nineveh, isn't it? Okay? There's a little bit of irony there, I think, that the gospel first comes to Gentiles in the place where a Jew who was sent to Gentiles tried to run away from his job. It's really very interesting. Okay? So... I think it's time for us to look at Acts chapter 1. All right, so get out your Bible if you have one. We've already read through the first three verses. So I want to start with verse 4. And our goal, if possible, is to get through Acts chapter 1 tonight. I'm not sure we will. We'll see how far we get. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together. By the way, in case you're wondering, I read from the New King James. Right? There are lots of different translations out there. That's what I happen to use. Uh, and being assembled together with them, he, and this is speaking of Christ, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. Now, Jesus is referring back to what he had said to them in the upper room discourse that's recorded in John chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. Remember? Jesus tells the disciples that he's about to leave, and they're really upset. And they say, why can't we follow you? And he said, well, you can't come now. You will come later. But it's to your advantage that I leave. Because if I stay, I can't send the Holy Spirit. But if I leave, I can send him to you. That's the promise to which he is referring here. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, 
but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, it's interesting the way he said that. He didn't say 10 days from now. He didn't say five days from now. He just said soon. And I think that's why, after he leaves, they go to the upper room and they have a prayer meeting. And this prayer meeting is going to go on for several days because they don't know when this is going to happen. They know it's a good thing. They know it's coming, but they don't know when. So they do the smart thing. They pray about it. Now, look at verse 6. This is a very controversial few verses, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. <coughs> Look at that question. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now let's have a little bit of a review of Old Testament history. Who was the first king of Israel? Saul. Followed by? David. Followed by? <coughs> Solomon. Now when Solomon died... You recall that the kingdom split, right? When the kingdom splits, from that point forward, we've got what's called the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom would come to be called Israel, and the southern kingdom would come to be called Judah. By the way, if you're wondering why in the New Testament Jews are called Jews, and why in the Old Testament they're called Israelites or Hebrews, it's because... The southern kingdom was the last part to survive. And by New Testament times, Israelites all live in Judea, so they call them Jews. Okay, But a Jew is an Israelite. There's no difference. It's really the same term. Okay. Well, when Solomon dies... Because he had been a foolish man, because he had married many idolatrous wives, God punished the nation and punished his son by causing the kingdom to split, as we said. And we've now got a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, and they're going to continue to exist side by side until the year 722. Now, between 931, when the kingdom splits, and 722, at times the two kingdoms are going to be friendly, at times they're going to be enemies. But the northern kingdom is going to have a succession of short-lived dynasties, and every one of those kings is going to be unfaithful to God. And so in 722, God will say, I've had enough, and he will send the Assyrians in. The Assyrians will conquer the northern kingdom and deport most of their people and spread them all over the Assyrian Empire. The southern kingdom, at the beginning, had mostly godly kings. But as time passes, some of them begin to slip, and it sort of goes like this. Good, 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 bad. Good, 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 bad, bad. Good, good, bad, bad. Good, bad, bad, bad. It's something like that. It's, it's, it's a downward spiral. And so in 586, God allows the Babylonians to conquer the southern kingdom. They deport the Jews from the southern kingdom, and they spread them over the Babylonian Empire. Well, guess what? The Babylonian Empire is nothing but the Assyrian Empire, the same real estate in the hands of other people. So when the southern kingdom falls in 586 B.C., and those people are deported, they end up meeting a lot of their relatives who were deported about 150 years earlier. There's a kind of a reunion within the Babylonian Empire. Now, from that point forward, there never is a king in Israel. Israel will continue to be a subject state there still isn't a king in Israel. But the Old Testament predicted very clearly <clears throat> that after a time during which Israel's kingdom would be dissolved, one day God would reestablish that kingdom 
and it will be reigned over by a descendant of King David. Now, I think you all understand from re reading the Gospels that Jesus is the son of David, right? He is the Messiah. And I think you probably all know that the word Messiah in Hebrew is actually Mashiach. Now, I just spit on the people in the front row, right? That, that's the way you're supposed to say it. But Mashiach is, is the equivalent of the Greek word Christos, which English speakers say Christ. Both of those words mean the anointed person. Now, in the Bible, priests and kings get anointed. So when we say that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, we are saying that he is the promised descendant of King David who will reign over the nation of Israel. Now, here's where the debate comes in, in Acts chapter 1. When the apostles ask, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, some Christians think that the church is the kingdom. And other Christians say, no, the church is not the kingdom that's predicted in the Old Testament. Now, these are differing views on what we would call eschatology, the study of the end times. I personally am a premillennialist, which means I believe that at some time in the future, Jesus will return to this earth after a seven-year tribulation period, and he will reign over this earth for a thousand years, and at the end of that thousand years, then God will destroy this universe, replace it with a new universe, what the Bible calls the new heavens and new earth. That's the pre-millennial view, and I'll show you that on the screen in a moment. The other view is that the church is the kingdom and that Jesus is reigning over the church as the king of the church now. Now, depending on which one of those views you hold, you're going to have a different understanding of how Jesus responds to the question that the disciples have just asked him. Now, let me show you those uh, pictures in a schematic way on the screen, and then we'll look at Jesus' response. Okay? These are the three basic views on eschatology. Now, by the way, if you want to know more about this, buy this book. <laughs> okay? And I will be happy to autograph books if you want, and not if you don't want. Okay. Now, the first two views that I'm going to be putting up here are called the amillennial view and the postmillennial view. As far as the sequence of events in these two views, they're exactly the same. Both amillennialists and postmillennialists believe that we are living in the church age after the cross and that the next event that's going to happen is going to combine the rapture, the second coming of Christ, the great white throne judgment, the destruction of this universe, and the creation of the new universe. So this single event is the dividing line between what we would call time and future eternity. You see that? So they believe that the second coming, the rapture, and the great white throne judgment are all combined in a single great event. Okay? Both amillennialists and postmillennialists believe this. The only difference between their views is that amillennialists believe that the world is going to go downhill spiritually as we approach this date, and postmillennialists believe that the church is going to improve the world spiritually until Jesus comes back. All right? Now, this view is more biblical because the New Testament very clearly says that things are going to get worse before Jesus comes back. This view is primarily driven by the expansion of the Roman Empire in the 1800s, believe it or not. Okay? Now, the third view is the pre-mill view. Okay? The pre-mill view is much more complicated. It's more complicated because it takes 
the rapture, the second coming, and the great white throne judgment, which are all combined as a single event here, and it spreads them out. Okay, let me use my laser so I don't get in front of the screen. Premillennialists believe that the next event is going to be the rapture. It will be followed by the seven-year tribulation. This is the time during which the Antichrist will rise to power. Christ will return at the second coming. He will depose the Antichrist. Um, he will cast Satan into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, and then he will reign over this earth, and his subjects during this time will include mortal survivors who have lived through the tribulation and haven't died. It will include us because we will be resurrected and return to earth with him. And it will include Old Testament believers who will also be resurrected. So during this little period of time, Jesus is going to be reigning on this earth over mortal, reproducing, ordinary people and also resurrected saints. At the end of that time, the book of Revelation in chapter 20 says that Satan will be released for a brief time, that some of the people of the earth, the, the mortals, will join him in an attempt to overthrow Christ's reign. It will fail. And the result of that failure will be that it will be time for the great white throne judgment where all the unsaved dead of all time will be formerly judged and then sent into the lake of fire, and all the saved people of all time will live on and live into the new heavens and new earth. Now, the most important thing about all three of these systems is that in the end, we get to the new heavens and new earth. That's the most important thing, right? And all Christians agree on this. All Christians agree that Christ will return and that he will reign in eternity, and that we will rule and reign with him, and it's going to be a great thing. But the details between wherever we are now, we're somewhere in this purple thing, right? And when we get there, vary in these two views. Now, go back to Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> let's read the question, and then let's read Jesus' answer. The question is, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, here is the answer that Jesus gives. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his authority. Now, what do you think Jesus is saying with that answer? Is he telling them, you just asked me a stupid question? Is that what it sounds like? Does it sound like he's saying, you boneheads, you just asked me a stupid question. That's not what it sounds like at all, is it? All he's saying is, I'm not at liberty to give you the answer to the question. Now, by the way, I can prove to you that it wasn't a stupid question. People who hold to these two views will typically say it was a stupid question, but I can prove to you that it wasn't a stupid question. So I want you to turn back to the end of Luke. All right, turn to the end of Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. In Luke 24, Jesus is beginning to appear to people after his resurrection, and he meets with the apostles, and in verse 44, look what he says to them. Verse 44 of Luke 24. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now he's talking about Old Testament prophecy about Messiah. Now if you have read the Old Testament, you're probably aware that there's a huge body of prophecy predicting Messiah's future kingdom. All right? Now look at verse 45. This is the key. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Do you see that? If Jesus is your teacher, and if Jesus zaps your brain so that you can understand, do you think you can get it wrong? 
They didn't get it wrong. They got it right. And so in Acts chapter 1, when they ask, will you, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's a good question. And when Jesus says, I can't tell you, he's not saying, you got it wrong, there is no future kingdom for Israel. He's saying, I've got a job for you to do, and I can't tell you when that's going to happen. Now go back to Acts chapter 1, and let's see what the job is. Acts chapter 1. Let's read verse 7 and then verse 8. It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Judea and in Samaria, I'm sorry, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now that verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, basically gives you the structure of the book, doesn't it? It tells you what's going to happen. It is a command, and it's also a prediction. And the funny thing is, they didn't obey the command. So he sends persecution that forces them to fulfill the prediction, right? It's not until the stoning of Stephen that they actually leave Jerusalem and start going to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles. But that verse, Acts 1.8, basically lays out the whole book. Okay. Probably the most important verse in the entire book. All right, now, I'm not going to spend any more time on this subject of eschatology. Did anybody, any of you come to the General Certificate course on eschatology a couple of years ago? Some of you did. Okay. We may do that again in the future, but we're not going to focus on eschatology in this book. We're going to focus on what the book focuses on. Okay, so now we come to verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. This is the ascension of Christ to heaven. This is where he leaves the earth and... Where is he right now? Where is he right now? He's in heaven. Does he still have a physical body? Yes. Yes, he does. Jesus never gave up his physical body. When Jesus became incarnate in the womb of Mary, when he added human nature to himself, that was permanent in the sense that he never will stop being human. Now, when he was crucified on the cross and his human body ceased to function and they buried it in the ground, it was totally trashed. You know that? It was trashed. I mean, he was stabbed, he was beaten, he was slashed, he was pierced, his blood was all gone, his bodily fluids had all flown out. He was a wrecked corpse. Then a miracle occurs. Now, his body was not repaired. His body was transformed. The body that he arose in was a resurrection body. And a resurrection body is different than a mortal body. His resurrection body had and continues to have capabilities that our bodies don't have. If you've read the Gospels, you know that when the stone was rolled away, it wasn't to let Jesus out. It was to prove that he was already gone. How did he get out? He passed right through the stone walls. How did Jesus come into the locked room when he first visited the apostles? Remember they had the doors locked and the windows closed and everything? He passed right through the walls. His resurrection body had and has capabilities that our bodies don't have. And his resurrection body is an immortal body. Now in English, the word mortal means capable of dying. Every one of us in this room is mortal. And unless we live until the rapture, every one of us will die. 
But the body that Jesus has now is an immortal body, and one day we're going to get immortal bodies. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I'm getting old. By the grace of God, I'm still pretty vigorous. And I'm very happy about that. But my hair is falling out. My skin is getting saggy. Um, you know, I've got spots all over me. Um, and I'm slowly falling apart. It's going to be nice to get a new body. And I wonder whether it'll have hair, you know. Um, I, I really do. I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. But Jesus rose to heaven, and he is up there, and the book of Hebrews tells us that he is serving as our high priest in the presence of God the Father, interceding for us and advocating for us when we fall into sin or when we are in need. He's doing that right now. And one day he's going to come back. Now look what happens here. Look at verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. These are angels. Who said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Now look up at me. This is what they look like. <laughs> They just saw something they'd never seen. They saw Jesus rise up into the air and keep going until he disappeared into the clouds. An astonishing thing. Why are you still looking up there? Well, I think they're still looking up there because they're shocked. Now look what the angel says. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, listen to the words carefully, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now listen carefully to what they're saying. They're saying, you saw Jesus rise bodily, physically, visibly, and he went up into the sky, he went through the clouds, and he disappeared. He's going to come back in the exact reverse of that process. Now, I want you to turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. We're going to talk a little bit more about eschatology, and then we'll stop. I have to admit, I find it hard not to talk about eschatology. Um, Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel is having a vision, and we're just going to look at two verses. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14 of Daniel, chapter 7. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Remember what Jesus constantly called himself? The Son of Man. Okay? And what's it say? The next verse. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. You know what this is predicting? This is predicting the return which the angels were talking about in Acts chapter 1. Jesus departs with the clouds, and he's coming back with the clouds. Now, by the way, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he didn't come with clouds. He came with a lot of grunting and groaning and crying and screaming and blood and water and mess, right? He didn't appear out of the clouds. He appeared out of his mother's womb. This is talking about an event that hasn't happened yet. Now look what happens next in the prophecy in Daniel. This is the latter part of verse 13. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And the Ancient of Days is God the Father. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, do you see what this says? You put this together with Acts chapter 1, and it says that when Jesus departed in Acts chapter 1, he was going to heaven where he is now serving as high priest. One day he will come back, and when he does, that's when he will establish his kingdom. Now, can you see how you put Daniel chapter 1 together, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 7 together with Acts chapter 1? you get further confirmation 
that there is a future kingdom for the nation of Israel. That the premillennial view is correct, that there will be a millennium. And all the other things that go along with it, the tribulation, the antichrist, some of the things we don't like. But also that glorious time known as the millennium. Right? All of that is real. Israel has a future in God's plan. Now, Romans chapter 11 talks about you guys. Did you know that? The Chinese are mentioned in Romans chapter 11. Really? It says that hardness in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Do you realize that the nation of Israel has had to suffer for 2,000 years so that people like you could get saved? Think about that. God is postponing the time when the kingdom will be established in order that a huge harvest of Gentiles can come in. It's a good thing. It's part of his plan. But it's also hard for the Jews. Now, one day when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, God will again begin working with the Jews, and then there will be a big spiritual harvest of the Jews. And that's going to happen during the tribulation, which is actually going to be a time of many, many people getting saved. There will probably be billions of people saved during the tribulation. It's going to be a tough time to live, but any time when you live and you get saved is a good time to live. You know that? So God has great plans for the future. Okay, Now we've gotten through Acts chapter 1 up to verse 11. And what have we seen? We've seen that for 40 days after Christ's resurrection, he interacted with the apostles, teaching them to understand everything that the scriptures said about him, to understand the kingdom program, and he gave them a job to do. And the job is, basically, until I come back, your job is to tell the world the gospel. Now, it's interesting the way he describes telling the world the gospel. <clears throat> he doesn't say go out and preach John 3.16 at people, although they did. He said, you shall be my witnesses. Now, we Christians use the word witness in a totally weird way. And by the way, I wasn't saved until I was almost 27 years old. I grew up being very anti-Christian, so I don't have a church background. The first time I heard somebody saying, let's go out witnessing, I said, what? I said, we're going to go out witnessing. What do you mean? We're going to go tell people about Jesus. I said, that's not witnessing. That's testifying. Witnessing is observing. Testifying is telling. Right? In a courtroom, people don't witness. In a courtroom, you bring in people who have witnessed so they can testify. Right? You see an accident on the street? You can be a witness in court, but you don't go to court to witness. You go to court to testify. Now, we translate it, you will be witnesses to me, but the Greek literally says, you're going to tell the world what you saw. What did they see? They saw their master, whom they knew as well as they knew anybody. They lived with him for three and a half years. They went everywhere with him. They watched him die. They saw him buried and they went home and they cried like babies because their master was gone. And they thought that, was, that it was over. And then Sunday morning, somebody came and said, he's alive again. And you know what they did? They laughed. It was a bitter laugh. They didn't believe it. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to believe that he really was alive. And once they believed it, they knew this was a miracle. This was an unprecedented miracle. 
And then they listened for 40 days as he taught them. And then he said, I'm leaving, you got a job, go tell the world what you saw. And so that's what they did. That's what the book of Acts is about. It's about the apostles and other members of the early church going out to tell the world what they saw. And those apostles were so convinced that they really saw what they claimed they saw that they submitted to torture and execution rather than give up the story. One of the strongest proofs of the truth, truth of the gospel is the fact that the apostles allowed themselves to be tortured and executed, and they still didn't change their story. I was thinking about this recently because my family, you know, the family I come from, most of them are unbelievers. And it's hard to share the gospel with your family. You all know that, right? Hardest people in the world to share the gospel with is your own family. And one of my, my, my stepmother, I have two stepmothers, by the way. I have three mothers. My father was married three times. All three of them are Jewish. I have three Jewish mothers. Very strange. Um, my stepmother sent me an article recently, and the article was, the title was, Do Christians and Muslims Worship the Same God? Now that got me thinking, yeah, the answer is no, but that got me thinking, if I was to say to my stepmother, I believe the gospel is true because the apostles were willing to die for their faith she might come back to me and say, well, that doesn't prove anything unique about Christianity because Muslims are willing to die for their faith, too. They do it all the time. Right? But you know what the difference is? Muslims die for their faith killing people who they believe are their enemies who hate them. Christians die for their faith loving people who hate them. It's a huge difference, isn't it? It's a huge difference. Okay? If dying for your faith doesn't prove that what you believe in is true. But dying for your faith in the process of doing a kindness to a person who abuse you as your enemy, that says a lot. That says a lot. Okay? Now... We don't have time to finish the rest of the chapter. Let me just sort of give you a preview of what's going to happen in the rest of the chapter, and we probably won't talk about it anymore. I think next week we're going to jump right in in chapter 2, because chapter 2 of the book of Acts is fantastic, it's fascinating, it's epical, um, and I don't want to shortchange it. The rest of, the, of chapter 1, what you will see is you will see the apostles... <coughs> praying as they wait for this gift of the Holy Spirit. You will see them saying, we need to round out the number so we have an even dozen, because Judas is gone. And so they're going to choose Matthias by lot. Now, choosing Matthias by lot is using a biblical technique. That's something that comes from the Old Testament. However, um, there's no evidence that they prayed before they did that. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, the text doesn't say it. Theologians have been arguing for centuries as to whether what they did was the right thing. Did they jump the gun? Did they act without God's authorization? Should they have just waited so that when Paul became an apostle, we had a nice number 12? <laughs> But then Paul comes along, we've got 13. Was Matthias really approved by God? Wasn't he? Now, I do want to say one thing about Matthias. You never hear his name again in the Bible, right? But what were the criteria by which they decided who could be a candidate for a replacement apostle? Well, let's take a look at that. Verse 21, Acts chapter 1. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time 
that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Now, whether they should have replaced Judas or not, they were right in understanding that a person who was going to fulfill the mission that was given to them must be, like them, someone who had walked with Jesus, someone who had witnessed his death, someone who had witnessed his resurrection, and some who had witnessed someone who had witnessed his ascension. I don't know whether it was right for them to choose Matthias, but they were right in understanding that the qualifications for an apostle must be someone who had seen all those things. Okay. Now, let me throw one more idea at you, and then we're going to pray and we're going to quit. If an apostle is a person who walked with Jesus, who lived under his teaching, who witnessed his death, who witnessed his resurrection, and who witnessed his ascension, then there can be no more apostles. Okay? Now, every once in a while, someone will show up and he'll say, I'm, an, I'm a new apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, Joseph Smith, who founded the Mormons, claimed that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And other people have shown up and said, I'm an apostle. Well, I'm sorry. You can't be an apostle unless you lived in the first century and you walked with Jesus you, walk, you saw him die, you saw him rise, and you saw him ascend. So let's not be fooled by anybody who comes along and says, I'm an apostle, I have a message from you, for you from God, and you must listen to it. Don't be fooled if anybody like that shows up. They're not an apostle. We don't need anything as far as revelation that we don't have already. Right? We got everything we need here. We also have the privilege of prayer. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have fellowship with each other. Um, we've got the high priestly ministry of Christ. We've got everything we need to live godly lives and to fulfill God's mission for us. The question isn't getting something we need that we don't have. The issue is using what we've got. Okay. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for these men who you called to walk with your son, to sit under his teaching, to share bread with him, to watch him die and to see him risen again, to sit under his teaching for those 40 days, and to observe him as he left our earth. Thank you that although they weren't perfect men, you empowered them by your spirit to carry out their mission and that they did it well. Thank you that they did it well, for if they had not we would not likely know you today. Thank you for the generations of Christians who went before us, who labored, sometimes suffered and died to bring your word to us both in its written form and in the proclamation of it. Help us, Father, in our generation to be faithful too so that until your son comes back, your church may be busy about the task that you have given us, which is the task of contending once for all for the faith delivered to the saints and the task of spreading the gospel by the Great Commission. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and representing you in the world. Help us, Father, to have a proper, humble, pride in that mission. Teach us not to be ashamed of our Lord. It's so easy to do that in a world that ridicules him and that ridicules us, but teach us nonetheless to be proud that you have 
called us to be your children and given us a task. Father, as we dismiss now to go home, grant us safe travel and help us to treat with love and kindness those who are waiting for us at home. This we pray through Christ. Amen. Okay, see you next week.